Hello everyone and welcome to Light Channel Denmark. Today we are again blessed having Pat Aravito with us from California. And Pat has been with us several times now. Uh, she had two programs where she has been sharing different parts of her testimony, which is very touching and I will really encourage you to watch them. And I will also encourage you to watch her programs about the history of the Sabbath. That's six programs. And I'm amazed how God has had people all through the ages which has kept his Sabbath holy. And today, uh, Pat is going to uh, talk about the change of the day, how Sabbath became Sunday. How did that happen? We know that uh, the Lord, he created everything so beautifully in six days. And on the seventh day, he was resting. And in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3, we read, Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creation that he had done. But can you believe it did not take long before worship was corrupted? And this Pat is going to share with us. And do you believe what they were doing? They started with sun worship. And the Lord is so merciful. He's trying in every possible way to teach us people his way. So um, he was uh, actually uh, letting bread coming down from heaven for six days in a certain time. And on the seventh day, no bread was coming, just to show the Israelites which day he wanted to sp spend special time with them. And then the Israelites, they came to Mount Sinai. And there God gave them the Ten Commandments, which also Pat is going to share with us. And we can read in chapter 20, verse 8 to 10, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, your God, and it it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sonner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So there we again, we can see that God, he starts with the word remember, because he knows that we so easily forget what he's saying. And, uh, but believe it or not, long time after God has spoken so clearly with them, we will hear, Pat will share with us how they started to do sun worship again. You know, it's just like we people. We are just like small children. Our parents are telling us what is right and what is wrong. But we are saying, I want to do it my will, by my way. And it's just like people have been doing that also with the day to worship. And um, um, in um, a very dangerous time, well, first we can see how Jesus came and he is saying in John 14, 6, Jesus said unto him, I'm the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So Jesus, he showed us the way. He showed us the Sabbath was the right day to worship. And um, so that's the way. There is no other way than to follow Christ. But just a few words, a few years after Christ was here, what do you, what happened then? Sun worship again. And in um, um, what happens around 300, then sun worshippers, sun worshippers, and Christians united, and that's a very, very dangerous thing. And you know, it happened something very strange around 312. Then Constantine came up and say, said that he saw a cross in the sky. And that Pat will share with us what was that all about. And he actually made the first Sunday law in 321. And um, Pat is also going to share with us how 
the different countries started to keep Sabbath holy. And um, in John 15, 14, 15, it's written, if you love me, keep my commandments. So that is how we can show God love back, that we are keeping his commandments. In Isaiah 56, 2, it's written, blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold of it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. So let's pray. The other Father in heaven, we are so grateful that we can pray to you, the Creator, on heaven and earth and everything which is therein. We are so grateful, Lord, that you have put aside one day a week we can which you want to bless us in a special way. Lord, you, the Bible is saying that uh, you created, you spoke this world into existence. And uh, just like you spoke the, this world into existence, you also have the power to recreate our hearts when we, give, so when we give ourselves fully to you. We thank you, Lord, that you also have the power to create a new heaven and a new earth. And we are so much looking forward for that. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our example in everything. You keep kept the Sabbath, and even on the new earth, we are going to keep Sabbath. We pray, Lord, that you will be with Pat now, as she is going to share this very interesting story about how Sabbath becomes Sunday. And I pray that our viewers will see the blessing of keeping and following what Jesus has been telling us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. How Sunday Became Sabbath, or How Sabbath Became Sunday, the Change of the Day. Today, we're going to talk about that big story. In the beginning, in an act of divine love, the Creator God created the heavens and the earth. He spoke it into existence, one day at a time, and God saw that it was good. For six days, God spoke. And on the sixth day, God created man in his own image. Male and female created he them, and God blessed them. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. Dr. Tamara Kohn Eskenazi is professor of Bible at Hebrew Union College. She puts it this way. What did God create on the seventh day? As a matter of fact, God created nothing on the seventh day. God created no thing. But instead, God created a context in which everything that has been created in the natural world, the material world, and life itself can really be appreciated and enjoyed and celebrated. The seven-day cycle established by God and culminating in his Sabbath governs our lives to this day. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. That's Genesis 2-3. Adam and Eve's full, first full day of life was Sabbath. Did you realize that? God on that first Sabbath, in this sign of God's love and power and creative works, it was God's seventh day, but it was Adam and Eve's first day of life. So what does that word blessed mean? The word is Barak in Hebrew, and it means to receive God's favor or to cause to prosper. And what does it mean that he sanctified that day? The Hebrew word is Kadash. It means he instituted or pronounced or observed as clean ceremonial or morally, to institute or appoint, used as a public proclamation. Some people argue that the day was only for God, not for man, but the word here means to institute or appoint or use as a public proclamation. It's a sign, Exodus 31, 17 tells us, a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So it was a reminder, a memorial of the one who created it. 
a memorial of the creator and a sign of his love, power, and works. It was God's intent that everything in his new world would prosper in the atmosphere of his love. Empowered with the gift of choice and given a whole day every week to ponder God's goodness and his creation, mankind had the freedom and the ability to love God back. Innate and in divine love is free will, the right and the ability to choose. Love can't be forced. It can only be chosen. Living in the atmosphere of pure, absolute love, human beings could freely choose to love. They could also choose not to. Divine love allowed men to choose against God as well as for God. So man could choose his own prosperity or his own destruction. But from the very beginning, God devised a plan, should the unthinkable happen and his beautiful new people choose not to love, choose to destroy themselves. His plan would give them another chance. It would save them and deliver them. You know the plan. God himself, Jesus, would put himself in their place and take the death. And he would give them his life. Second Timothy 1.9 tells us, God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Through this great plan, human beings would, deliver, would be delivered from slavery, slavery to their unbelief and guaranteed the continued freedom and power to choose to love. We all know what happened. And the woman did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. Genesis 3, 6. Rebellion and disobedience took the place of love and unity. Their son Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering to the Lord. But unto Cain and his offering, God had not respect. Cain's unbelief corrupted the worship of the Creator God into the worship of the things he had created. And thus, in that first act of willful worship, began the false religion that has seduced millions of people in all ages. Rebellion escalated, and as time passed, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Genesis 6, 5. Can you imagine Adam's grief as he saw his descendants worship the creation, the cosmos primarily, in a religion that spread across Mesopotamia, competing with creator worship century after century, millennia after millennia? The sun took the place of the creator God as the object of man's worship. It had various names in the different cultures. In Sumeria, it was called Asher, in Babylon, Shamash. In Canaan, it was Baal and Moloch. In Assyria, it was Baal. In Egypt, it was Ra, Aton, and Osiris. Tyre and Sidon, it was Baal. As the Sabbath of God's creation was ignored and lost, the weekly cycle that had been aligned with the weekly Sabbath was now aligned with the seven wandering stars or planets, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, the Sun, Venus, Mercury, and the Moon, who were considered to be gods that somehow affected life on Earth. Each planetary god ruled its own day, and of course, the Sun ruled the first day. Let me make one thing clear, holy, about Sun worship. Mosheim tells us in his commentaries, their festivals and other solemn days were polluted by a licentious indulgence in every species of libidinous excess. And on these occasions, they were not prohibited even from making the sacred mansions of their gods the scenes of vile and beastly gratification. It was all about the exaltation and worship of fertility. The day of the sun was not in any way a holy day. It was out of the sun-worshipping nation of Ur of the Chaldees that the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and you shall be a blessing. Through Abraham, God would establish a nation that would remember his law and him and his Sabbath, and that would be a blessing, missionaries if you would, to a world consumed in pagan sun-worship and idolatry. Abraham's descendants came up out of Egypt. They ended up in Egypt as slaves to that sun-worshipping nation. 
But at the end of 400 years, 430 years, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. God delivered them from Egyptian bondage. In the wilderness, on their journey, God brought them back to a knowledge of himself, the Creator God. He promised to be their God and take care of them. He tells us in Exodus 16, 4, Behold, I'll rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. Six days shall you gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. God was restoring to them their spiritual heritage and teaching them that he was their provider. They would live by his hand, by his power. On Sabbath, they would still eat even though they did not gather. Out there in the wilderness, camp beside Mount Sinai, the Israelites waited nervously while Moses, up in that fiery cloud, talked to God. God wrote his law for them with his own finger on a tablet of stone, unchangeable. They needed to be educated in the principles of God's way and his government. The fourth law reminded them of his day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Exodus 20. Of all ten commands, only the fourth identifies who is giving these laws. The Lord your God, the one who made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. And who therefore? You, your son, your daughter, male and female servants, your cattle and the stranger in your home. And what is he commanding? Keep holy the Sabbath day. How? Work the first six days, rest from work on the seventh day. And why? Because the Creator rested on that day and blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. As our Creator, He only has the right to ask for our worship. No one else, nothing else, not stones or images or created things, nothing else has the right to our worship. Only the one who made us has the right to our worship and has the right to ask for our worship. As Israel stood on the borders of the promised land, Moses reviewed their history with them, begging them to remain faithful to God. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore, the Lord commanded you to keep holy the Sabbath day, Deuteronomy 5. A new meaning was added to the Sabbath. It had memorialized creation, and now it was to be a reminder of deliverance as well, deliverance from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. Israel enjoyed the promised land, but as time passed, they again neglected the worship of God and forgot his Sabbath. Many Israelites adopted the sun worship of the surrounding nations. Ahab served Baal, and then later Jehu destroyed Baal out of Egypt. For years, Israel and Judah went in and out of sun worship, losing God's protection, going into captivity, repenting, only to succumb again to the idolatry around them. The prophet Ezekiel was shocked to find Israelites worshiping the sun god Tammuz. In Ezekiel 4, he tells us, He brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house, and to my dismay, women were sitting there worshiping, weeping for Tammuz into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, about five and twenty men, and they worshiped the sun toward the east. Captivity to Babylon was imminent. Jeremiah, the prophet thrown in the pit, made a plea for the Sabbath. Jeremiah 17, Take heed to yourselves, and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem, but hallow the Sabbath day, as I commanded your fathers. Sabbath and holiness went together. Ezekiel 20, Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Sabbath was not only the sign of the Creator and a reminder of their Deliverer, the prophet Ezekiel calls it a symbol of the one who sanctifies, the God who makes holy. God promised, I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. Ezekiel 9. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, Ezekiel 36. And I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. 
I am the Lord your God. With Babylon threatening invasion, God begged his people to obey. They refused. Just what Jeremiah warned about had happened. Israel was overrun. Her youth were exiled to the Babylonian court. Jerusalem was destroyed. Seventy years passed and the time came for their deliverance. Nehemiah, cut bearer to King Artaxerxes, got permission from the king to go help them. He was shocked to discover the Sabbath again forgotten, desecrated with commerce. How could they hope for God's blessing and power if they forgot his day? Nehemiah 13, he said, And I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, What evil thing is this that you do and profane the Sabbath day? Didn't your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? And yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. This time, the lesson of remembering the Sabbath seems to have stuck, but not the part about trusting in God, the Deliverer and the Sanctifier. Several hundred years passed after the Babylonian captivity and Jesus was born. During that time, the Hebrew leaders, to keep themselves from making the mistakes of their forefathers, made up their own laws to protect the Sabbath. A lot of laws. There were 39 classes, 1,500 Sabbath rules. You couldn't tie or untie a knot. You couldn't write more than one letter. You couldn't carry a burden. You couldn't light anything or put out a light. You couldn't assist anyone except in an emergency. Now the Sabbath had lost its meaning in a different way. It became a burden, impossible to keep holy or enjoy. Its meaning as a symbol of God's sanctifying power was lost in the focus on human works. But Jesus came to live the true Sabbath. He longed for people to experience it as a blessing. It says in Mark 2, 27 and 28, the Sabbath was made for man, mankind, and not man for the Sabbath. That word mankind, anthropos, means all mankind, not only the seed of Abraham. Jesus even called himself the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus did not keep the Sabbath according to the 1500 man-made rules. As Lord of the Sabbath, he came as the deliverer, and he made the Sabbath a day of deliverance. The Gospels tell the stories of seven, seven miracles of Sabbath deliverance. We'll look at a couple of them a little closer, but just to run through them. In Mark 1, Jesus healed a demon-possessed man on Sabbath. In Luke 4, he healed Peter's mother-in-law. Luke 13, he healed the woman who was bent over. In Luke 14, he healed the man with dropsy. John 5, there was the crippled man at the pool that Jesus healed. John 9, he healed the man that was born blind. Mark 3, he healed the man with the withered hand. When the man with the withered hand came to the synagogue on Sabbath, the Pharisees watched to see if Jesus would break the Sabbath, would work on that day by healing him. Jesus called the man forward and he asked the Pharisees, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? The Pharisees had no answer. Grieved in his heart, Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand, stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. That's Mark 3. Is it legal to do good on the Sabbath? The prophet Isaiah had answered that question many centuries earlier. In Isaiah 58, isn't this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread to the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? And when you see the naked, that you cover him? And you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. If you turn your foot away from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. This is what the Sabbath was for. On Sabbath, man was to rest from his own works but not from the works of God. It was another Sabbath when a poor woman bent over for many years came to the temple. Jesus had compassion on her. The story is told in Luke 13. Jesus said, Woman, 
you're loosed from your infirmity. Angered by Jesus' blatant disregard for their man-made rules, the Pharisees went out immediately and plotted with the Herodians against Jesus how they might destroy him. Interestingly enough, the Herodians were their worst enemies until Jesus bound them together by their hatred for him. Because he had done these things on the Sabbath, and they succeeded in putting Jesus to death. Ironic, isn't it? To destroy the very one who showed the way of love, God's love. It really comes down to the question, do we obey the way of love? Do we obey, obey God's laws? Or do we listen and obey the rules of men? Do we obey God's word? Or do we hear man's word and do it? And do we keep God's day? Or do we follow man's day? And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after. They observed the tomb and how his body was laid. And they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. And when they came back early Sunday morning, Jesus was not there. He had risen. Yet there is no biblical evidence that his commandment was changed by his death and resurrection. The Gospels were written over the years after Jesus ascended back to heaven. Matthew, probably in the year 60 to 70 AD. Mark, they say, probably between 55 and 70. Luke, about the same time period. And John, not till 90. And yet none of them make any mention of any change in the Sabbath day. In fact, Jesus himself included the Sabbath in his warning of future persecution. He said in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, pray that your flight be not in winter or on the Sabbath day. As time passed, the disciples and apostles continued worshiping on the Sabbath. The apostle Paul record, records many Sabbaths when he preached to Jews and Gentiles. In Acts 1, by the river at Philippi, in Acts 13, in the synagogue to the Gentiles, and in Antioch in Asia Minor. In Acts 18, every Sabbath for a year and a half, he preached in Corinth. In Acts 17, he preached in Thessalonica. And in Acts 18 again, in Antioch, he preached for six months with both, to both Jews and Gentiles. At the same time, they continued in their affiliation with their own kinsmen, the Jews. Dr. Gerard Domstieck, the church his, professor of church history at the Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University said, the early Christians saw the relationship to Judaism not as a kind of discontinuity, but as a progression. In effect, their religion was a fulfillment of all the hopes and expectations of the Old Testament. The Messiah had come. Christians worshipped in the synagogue with the Jews on Sabbath, and they viewed themselves as Jews, except now they had the long-awaited Messiah. But the atmosphere in the Roman Empire became more, made it more and more difficult to be a Christian. The Jews hated and persecuted the Christians. The pagans hasted, hated and persecuted the Christians. The Romans hated and persecuted the Jews and didn't differentiate the Christians. The Roman Empire did not recognize Christianity as a legal religion. Eventually, the Christians were forced to separate from the Jews. Sun worship, with its Sunday, was the prevailing religion of the Roman Empire. There were various forms of sun worship. There was Zoroastrianism, Druidism, nature and fertility cults, Greek mythology, and Mithraism. And there was constant conflict between the Jews and the sun-worshipping Romans. In addition, the Jews hating the Roman yoke fomented uprisings. Emperor Hadrian, in retaliation, outlawed the Sabbath and other Jewish observances in Jerusalem which of course caused another uprising, which made the Jews all the more hated, <clears throat> and the Christians as well, because they were associated with the Jews. Finally, the Roman empires wanted only one religion in their empire. They tried to combine all religions into one. Pagan gods were renamed with Christian names. Jupiter became Peter. Pagan rites were mixed with Christian holy days, Christmas and Easter, for example. Jupiter became Peter, and now resides in the Vatican getting his toe kissed by faithful penitents. T.H. Moore tells us, Sunday being the day on which the Gentiles solemnly adored the planet and called it Sunday, the Christians thought fit to keep the same day. 
in the same, <clears throat> excuse me, in the same name for it, that they might not appear causelessly peevish, and by that means hinder the conversion of the Gentiles, and bring a greater prejudice against them than might otherwise be taken against the gospel. <clears throat> So some Christians, especially in Alexandria and Rome, thought they could convert pagans more easily if they adopted their day. Add that to their desire to distance themselves from the hated Jews, and you have the perfect reason for a Christian Sunday. Let's talk a bit about the process. <clears throat> there were other influences undermining Sunday. From Alexandria and Egypt came the first Christian doctrine document that promoted Sunday observance. It's called the Epistle, Epistle of Barnabas. That's not Paul's Barnabas. It's an unknown Barnabas. Written early in the second century, the Epistle of Barnabas allegorized the Sabbath and called the Sabbath a metaphor for God's eternal rest rather than a literal rest day. The Epistle of Barnabas honored Sunday as the eighth day, which since the number eight is greater than seven, the eighth day would be greater than the seventh day. <clears throat> the second oldest document showing evidence of the attempt to undermine Sabbath and replace it with Sunday comes from Rome and dates about 150 AD. It's found in the writings of Justin Martyr, who was a pagan convert to Christianity who died for his faith in Rome about 165. Justin Martyr mixed Platonic philosophy with Christianity. He too allegorized the Bible and went so far as to say, that God imposed Sabbath on the Jews to punish them. To him, Sabbath wasn't a day of joy and celebration, but rather it was a curse, God's punishment on Jews for their unfaithfulness. Justin talks about the Sunday practice of the Christians in Rome. He ties Sunday to the resurrection of Jesus, the eighth day or day after the seventh, and he ties it to creation, not as a memorial of God's created work, but as the beginning of God's creation. The eighth day as the beginning of God's creation. This is a direct challenge to God's establishment of the Sabbath at the end of creation week. In Alexandria, the influence of Mithraism also aided in the paganizing of Christianity. Clement of Alexandria in 185 adopted the pagan Mithraic title, the Lord's Day for Sunday. It's interesting that Diocletian called Mithras the protector of the empire. He was their god. A few years later, the Bishop of Rome, Pope Pius, and then Victor I, attempted to require Christians to celebrate Passover on Easter by threat of excommunication. They refused, but it was carried at the Council of Nicaea in 325. In the fourth century, Sunday got a big boost from Emperor Constantine who claimed to have converted to Christianity after seeing a cross in the sky before a battle. That was in 312. He won the battle, but even though he adopted Christianity in a sense, he was still a sun worshiper. In 313, he established the Edict of Milan, which legalized Christianity. And in 321, he established the first law for the observance of Sunday. He said, let all the judges and town people and all artisans rest on the venerable day of the sun, which by the way is Christian talk, but pagan talk. Let those who are situated in the country freely and at full liberty attend to the cultivation of their fields. Sunday didn't completely take over because a few years later, the council of Laodicea demanded that Christians should not Judaize and be idle on Saturday, but shall work on that day. But the Lord's day they shall especially honor, and being Christians shall, if possible, not work on that day. If, however, they are found Judaizing, they shall be shut out from Christ. The, the accusation of Judaizing usually referred to people who are working. So they were not to work on, the, on their Saturday. They were not to work on Sunday, and if they are caught working, they were to be shut out from Christ. Anti-Jewish sentiment had much to do with the promotion of Sunday. Constantine said, let us then have nothing in common with the detestable Jewish crowd. Pope Sylvester I, who reigned over the Roman church at the same time that Constantine ruled the Roman empire, echoed that sentiment. He said, 
If every Sunday is to be observed joyfully by Christians on account of the resurrection, then every Sabbath on account of the burial is to be re regarded in execration of the Jews. He's the first one who officially titled Sunday the Lord's Day. However, a hundred years later, Sabbath was still the primary day of worship among Christians. Socrates Scholasticus pointed out in the fifth century, for although most, almost all Christians throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries on the Sabbath of every week, yet the Christians of Alexandria and at Rome, on account of some ancient tradition, have ceased to do this. Coleman, in Ancient Christianity Exemplified, pointed out that Sunday was never called Sabbath during those early centuries. During the early centuries of the church, it, the first day, was never entitled the Sabbath, this word being confined to the seventh day of the week, the Jewish Sabbath, which, as we have already said, continued to be observed for several centuries by the converts to Christianity. The ancient Sabbath, according to Edward Brerud, did remain and was observed together by the Christians of the East Church above 300 years after our Savior's death. And besides that, no other day for hundreds of years was known by the name of the Sabbath. Sir William Domville wrote in his examination of the six texts, not any ecclesiastical writer of the first three centuries attributed the origin of Sunday observance either to Christ or to his apostles. So Sunday was not considered a replacement for Sabbath. Neither was the fourth commandment used to promote Sunday. Bishop Jeremy Taylor wrote, Yet the Lord's Day was not introduced by virtue of the fourth commandment, because they for almost 300 years together kept that day, which was the commandment. Coleman says, In time, after the Lord's Day was fully established, the observance of the Sabbath of the Jews was gradually discontinued, and was finally denounced as heretical. The observance of Sunday as a public festival during which all business with the exception of rural employments was intermitted came to be more and more generally established after this time throughout both the Greek and Latin churches. There's no evidence, however, that either in this or at a period much later, the observance was viewed as deriving any obligation from the fourth commandment that's from Robert Cox in his book, Sabbath Law Examined. So Sunday, to begin with, was a festival day rather than a holy day. Originally, then, no one claimed first day observance to be of divine origin. No one claimed that the Sabbath had been changed or that Sunday was a continuation of the Sabbath. Sunday was never called Sabbath. Sunday was a festival day. Abstinence from work was not a part of it. But in the beginning of the 5th century, both Pope Leo and Emperor Leo began to change the status quo for Sunday. Instead of the typical carnival atmosphere, they called for a more sacred Sunday and commanded that work cease on this day of restoration. In his dialogues on the Lord, Lord's Day, it says, It is our will and pleasure that the holy days dedicated to, to the Most High God should not be spent in sensual recreations or otherwise profaned by suits of law, especially the Lord's Day which we decree to be a venerable day, and therefore free it of all citations, executions, pleadings, and the like avocations. We command, therefore, all, as well husbandmen as others, to forbear work. This is where Sunday, as a Christian holy day, really began. Then there was the Sabbath fast. Back in the second century, an ambitious man by the name of Marcion had introduced a rather unorthodox idea. The Jewish, he said, the Jewish God is inferior. Christians should despise the Sabbath as Jewish, and Christians should fast on Sabbath to show contempt for the Jews. For these ideas, Marcion was excommunicated. He was considered a heretic. However, the Bishop of Rome liked his Sabbath fast idea and adopted it. The historian Neander tells us, in the Western churches, particularly the Roman, where opposition to Judaism was the prevailing tendency, this very opposition produced the custom of celebrating the Sabbath Saturday in particular as a fast day. The Bishop of Rome tried to enforce the Sabbath fast over the whole Christian world, but this only created divisions between the Eastern or Greek Christians and Roman Christianity. 
because the Greek church refused to fast. So the Latin or Roman church required fasting. The Greek or Eastern church refused to fast. Dr. George Dragas, professor of doctrine and church history at the Holy Cross School of Theology in Boston says, Sabbath fasting does not make any sense for the Orthodox because the Sabbath is the day that marks two great events, the completion of creation and the completion of redemption. So Sabbath is a day of double celebration and could never be associated with fasting in lament. For several hundred years, the Eastern and Western churches fought over the Sabbath fast. There was a council in Trullo where Emperor Justinian tried to arrest Pope Sergius for his refusal to cooperate against Sabbath fasting. The fast was condemned. Pope Sergius refused to sign and Emperor Justinian, who had called the council, ordered his arrest. Then in the ninth century, the Greek patriarch Photius excommunicated the Pope of Rome for encouraging his missionaries to undermine Greek teaching on the Sabbath. He said, using fraud and artifice, they have tried to turn these people from the pure faith of Christianity. They have required them to observe the Sabbath fast, contrary to the canons of the church. The conflict continued until 200 years later, Pope Leo IX sent a delegation to Constantinople to resolve doctrinal differences, including the fasting issue, with the Greek patriarch Michael Carolarius. Patriarch Michael Carolarius refused to meet the delegation. So after waiting for several months, on July 16, 1054, Cardinal Humberto, the papal representative, stalked into St. Sophia's during the worship hour and threw a paper down on the altar, a notice of excommunication for the patriarch. Michael Carolarius picked it up, threw it into the fire, and then turned around and excommunicated the cardinal and the pope, who had died three months earlier, but Carolarius didn't know that. This schism between the Greek and the Latin church lasted for almost a thousand years. Who knew that it was partially about the Sabbath fast? The Eastern world fought for the Sabbath. Far to the West, there was little papal influence for the first several hundred years after Christ. According to British tradition, the earliest Christianity came from the apostles. Peter, Paul, and Joseph of Arimathea were thought to be the first missionaries. Christianity took root in Britain and was well established by the 4th century when they were represented at the Council of Arles. When St. Patrick was born around 360, his family were part of that apostolic Bible-based Christianity. His father was a deacon, his grandfather a presbyter or missionary. Minister, Dr. Leslie Harding, author of The Celtic Church in Britain says, there is nothing in Patrick's works which indicates his acceptance of the teachings of church fathers. He appealed solely to the scriptures in support of what he believed, practiced, and propagated. His biographer wrote that every seventh day, Patrick and his friend Victoricus met together for prayer and fellowship and worship. With the Sabbath at its core, the Saturday was the rest day, according to McEwen, to the Lord's Day, no sabbatical ideas were attached. Two centuries later, Columba, one of Patrick's successors, established a school on the island of Iota. Roman influence had reached the British Isles by now, and both the Sabbath and Sunday were to set aside for worship. There were no Lord's Day ideas attached to Sunday. Sunday was not a Sabbath. The identification of the Lord's Day with the Sabbath had not yet been made. It seems to have been customary in the early churches, excuse me, it seems to have been customary in the Celtic churches of early times to keep Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, as a day of rest from labor. They obeyed the fourth commandment literally upon the seventh day of the week. This is found in James Moffat's book, The Church in Scotland. This was not without conflict. 500 years after Columba, King Malcolm of Scotland married a sweet Catholic princess named Margaret. She was shocked to find the people of Scotland working on Sunday and set about to reform them. The queen insisted upon the single and strict observance of the Lord's Day. People and clergy alike submitted, but not without entirely giving up their reverence for Saturday. The church at Rome waged a long campaign to make Sunday the official day of worship. A number of creative methods were developed. 
One was a ladder that supposedly came down from heaven and landed on an altar in Jerusalem, or Rome, depending on the story. This story was repeated in at least eight countries over a period of about 500 years between the 9th and the 14th centuries. So the letter from heaven, the epistle of Jesus, story comes to us from Ireland, England, Austria, Ethiopia, France, Iceland, India, and Spain. It threatens supernatural horrors for anyone who refused to honor Sunday by working on that day. It said, whatsoever plague and trouble has come into the world, it's through the transgression of Sunday that it has come. It was proved to be a base forgery propagated by Rome. Dr. Idino O'Leary, assistant professor of history at Notre Dame University says, the epistle of Jesus belongs to the massive body of apocryphal literature. That's to say, not canonical, not part of the Bible, and shouldn't be taken in any way at face value. The centuries of exalting Sunday and downplaying Sabbath had their desired effect. And by the time of the Reformation, the Sabbath had been largely forgotten. But reformers committed to sola scriptura, the Bible only, found no Sunday in the Bible. Melanchthon wrote in the Augsburg Confession, what ought we to think of the Lord's day? It is answered that the Lord's day and other such holy days ought to be kept because they are appointed by the church, but that the observance of them is not to be thought necessary for salvation, nor the violation of them regarded as a sin. That's from Cox's Sabbath laws. Reformers wanted the Bible as the authority. The state church considered herself authority enough. A church council was called to deal with, among other things, the issue of authority. It met at Trent in northern Italy from 1545 to 1563. The question to be decided was the role of scripture. Is it, as the reformers insist, the final word? The council, dominated by Roman scholars and clergy, reached a different conclusion. Their conclusion, authority rests on two pillars, tradition and scripture. In the 17th session on January 18, 1562, Caspar del Faso, Archbishop of Reggio, addressed that 17th session. He said, the Sabbath, the most glorious day in the law, has been changed into the Lord's day. This has not been done by the command of Christ, but by the authority of the church. Protestant reformers, by observing Sunday, gave credence to Rome's claim to have the authority to interpret scripture and to her claim to have changed the day and to her promotion of tradition as equal with scripture. John Eck called the most conspicuous champion of Roman Catholicism in the age of the Reformation was a theologian and a staunch defender of the Catholic Church during the early 16th century. He spoke about the power of tradition. The Sabbath is commanded many times by God. Neither in the Gospels nor in Paul is it definite that the Sabbath has ceased. Nevertheless, the Church has instituted the Lord's Day through the tradition of the Apostles without Scripture. Tertullian wrote of certain usages in Catholicism, including the matter of Sunday observance, If for these and other such rules you insist upon having positive Scripture injunction, you will find none. Tradition will be held for the originator of them, custom as their strengthener, and faith as their observer. John Brerley, priest, an alias for Lawrence Anderton, an Englishman who went to Rome and joined the Society of Jesus, wrote a book defending Catholicism in Protestant England, it was printed on a secret printing press, and it pointed out to Protestants that the alteration of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday is not proved by Scripture but is therefore apostolic tradition. That was in 1608, the Protestant apology for the Roman Church. Even Charles I of England, who faced numerous challenges to his religious authority, had to admit, for it will not be found in scripture where Saturday is no longer to be kept or turned into Sunday, wherefore it must be the church's authority that changed the one and instituted the other. This is echoed by the Roman Catholic Church in the 1942 Converts Catechism. Which day is the Sabbath? Saturday is the Sabbath. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? 
We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Roman Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, AD 336, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Tradition satisfied members of the Roman Church, but it wasn't a good reason for Protestants whose authority was the Bible. Most of them continued to worship on Sunday, so they needed a biblical reason for it. And in 1595, Nicholas Bound came up with it in his Doctrine of the Sabbath. He said that the seventh part of our time ought to be devoted to God, that Christians are bound to rest on the Lord's day as much as the Jews were on the Mosaic Sabbath, the commandment about being about rest being moral and perpetual, and that it was not lawful for for persons to follow their studies or worldly business on that day, nor to use such pleasures and recreations as are permitted on other days. So Nicholas Bound decided that one seventh of our time ought to be devoted to a Sabbath, but it doesn't have to be the seventh day. That didn't set so well with the seventh day men, a very vocal 17th century English English movement in defense of the seventh day Sabbath. Theophilus Brayborn, an Anglican clergyman in 1628 wrote a discourse on the Sabbath day. He said, when you can show me from scripture that there is any seventh day other than the day that we call Saturday, the last day of the week, then I might be persuaded that the fourth commandment means some other seventh day besides Saturday. I care not whether you keep Saturday Sabbath, Sunday Sabbath, or Monday Sabbath, but if we have respect to God or to his scriptures, let us give him the day of his own choice and not another. Braeburn was arrested, sent to London's gatehouse prison for a year and a half, and fined the equivalent of $150,000. His ministerial license was stripped away, and he was excommunicated. James Ockford, another Seventh-day man, wrote the Doctrine of the Fourth Commandment, in which he claimed the Fourth Commandment had been deformed by popery. He was excommunicated as well and sentenced to prison. His books were collected and burned. Hebrews 4.9 tells us that even today there remains, therefore, a rest to the people of God. Shall we enter into that rest? Shall we give God the day of his choice? Does it matter whether we worship on Sabbath, Sunday, or Monday? Paul tells us in Hebrews 4.10, For he who has entered into his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. The rest Paul's talking about here is the ceasing from our will and way and doing it God's way. It's ceasing from obedience to man's commands and entering into obedience to God's word. It's ceasing from our own striving, from thinking their own good works have merit, that if we can only make ourselves good enough, we'll be deserving of heaven and be able to acquire salvation and receiving the gift of God in Christ Jesus. He says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. For we who have believed do enter into rest. Here's what David said. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The original creator who created the world and me by the word of his mouth can create in us a new heart. 2 Timothy 4.18 tells us, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom ever. Amen. We rest on his Sabbath as a reminder and a memorial that we accept his deliverance from sin and trust implicitly in him for our salvation. In the words of Ezekiel, Paul promised, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Hebrews 10, 16 and 17. We believe and we're forgiven and sanctified. Jude 24 tells us, Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. Amen he who is able to save us. I like the way the reformer Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt said it. This day, this rest is realized in man's recognition that holiness comes 
from no other source than Christ, that we must be holy as God is holy. He saw Sabbath as a sort of inner sanctification. He understood the outward Sabbath as a help to achieve this inner Sabbath, this inner holiness. Because we cannot be holy aside from Jesus, and because it's so easy for us to lean on our own strength, so easy for us to forget to trust him, because we're so slow to rest our souls in him, the Creator said, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor the cattle which is within thy gates, nor the stranger which is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Isaiah tells us, Blessed is the man that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. We can rest in that Sabbath knowing that God makes us holy, and we can trust him for our salvation. Thank you.